Kapale, Agus Fajagu, Taitaska Yarloch. Thank you everyone for coming along this evening and a warm welcome to anyone who's new to a Gerloch Museum event. My name is Karen Buchanan and I'm curator of Gerloch Museum and delighted to welcome you this evening. So our speaker today is Jamie Arnold and he's sharing his award-winning research on an examination of the ideologies behind road construction as a relief project during the Great Highland Famine, so it's 1846 to 1850. And as well as providing details about the history and geography of the destitution roads, this will explore how organisations in Edinburgh, Glasgow and London believed that they could solve the Highland problem and improve the region by making material changes to the landscape. Jamie completed this research as an undergraduate thesis for Sydney Sussex College at the University of Cambridge, and it was selected as a winner of the Historical Geography Research Group's dissertation prize. Jamie's currently undertaking postgraduate study at the University of Glasgow, and I'm going to hand over to him just now. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks very much, Karen, for that lovely introduction. So I am going to talk about Gerloch, but I'm going to start somewhere that is perhaps a bit unexpected for everyone. Um, we're going to start in Sydney in 1988 um, with this band um, called Roaring Jack. Um, they had a song, um, a single called Destitution Road. Um, and so I've got some of the lyrics up here. They drove you out in the sleet and snow, the gales of Caledonia. When your house was burned and your crops as well, you stood and wept in the blackened shell, and the winter moor was a living hell for the gales of Caledonia. The plague and the famine, they dragged you down as you made your way to Glasgow Toon. You'd heard of a ship that was sailing soon for the shores of Nova Scotia, but there's no use getting frantic. It's time to hump your load across the wild Atlantic on the destitution road. So it's clear from this that there's a, a cultural memory of the destitution roads and even that maybe the destitution roads had some sort of links to clearances, emigration, famine, the erosion of traditional livelihoods. There's a slight problem with the historical accuracy of the song. Um, maybe it's something about Australians getting involved with Scottish history. I wouldn't want to call out Mel Gibson and Braveheart, but that um, leaps to mind pretty quickly. Um, there's a bit of a conflation of different periods of eviction and crop failure and disease and immigration um, in this song. And there's also some problems about the geography of Scotland and, and the physical location of the destitution roads. I'm sure people are thinking that that's not what they had understood by the destitution roads and they'd be right. It's used here um, mostly for its emotive weight. So the first job is to clarify some basics about the destitution roads. Um, what were they? Where were they? And finally, the slightly more difficult question, um, why were they built? Um, and so to do that, we need to start by thinking um, about the Great Highland Famine. Um, so I'm going to start by thinking about before the famine and the lead up to the famine. And I think there are four major trends, key trends that are interlinked um, in the build up to the famine that make the famine the event that it was. Um, and the first is the collapse in economic markets for the major produce from the highlands, which had afforded relative prosperity um, from 1760. Uh, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, um, the importation of Barilla, which was cheaper than the kelp produced in the highlands, um, meant that there was a collapse in the kelp market, um, but also cattle, mutton and wool, the other major produce from the highlands, was really less necessary um, after the end of the war. Second, and because of the kelp industry, which was so labour intensive, there had been a 53% population increase in the 40 years up to 1841. Um, and that was to capitalise on the comparative advantage that the Highlands had in the kelp industry. Third, and related to that overpopulation, um, tenancies had been subject to quite a lot of subdivision. Um, it was thought that only Crofts with a rental of above about £15 per annum were self-sufficient, um, but in the 1840s, roughly 9 in 10 Crofts were under £20 in rental, so they're very small Crofts that have been subject to subdivision. 
this was therefore a very vulnerable society. And it was hugely reliant on the potato. Um, it's been described by dietitians as the only single cheap food that can support life. And so John Sinclair reported in 1812 that potato agriculture could feed four times as many people for the same amount of land as grain produce could. Um, and so historians like Youngson have said that the Highlands was almost a potato economy. Um, now I think at the bottom it's important to note as well um, that this is a divided Highlands. It's not the same in the north and west as it is in the south and east. Destruction of the Runrig agricultural systems was far advanced in Perthshire and Argyll and Invernessshire. Um, there had been consolidation of arable farms and mixed agriculture in the Straths, and it had re um, resulted in emigration to the lowlands and the broad. There were more market towns in those south and eastern regions. In the north, however, the main trend was one of displacement towards the shore and more marginal land. Um, life was very precarious before the famine. And this is absolutely true in Gerlach as well. Um, we can see from some of the details of the Poor Law Commission of Inquiry in 1843, people are saying that pauperism has greatly increased and that the circumstances of the working classes were greatly deteriorated. Dr. John Mackenzie, of course, is in charge of um, the Gerloch lands at this point, while Sir Kenneth is in his minority, and he's particularly interested in scientific ideas of improvement that he's picked up from his days at Edinburgh University um, and the sorts of ideas that are popular in the low countries like Belgium and um, from the central board's records we can see that each family was entitled to four acres which is about 0 0.02 of a kilometer squared of spade culture so that's going to be mostly for potato growth and also from those central board records uh, we hear complaints that and this is a quote the most gross ignorance of the first principle of husbandry prevails now a little bit more research uh, resulted in finding that um, the main problem um, was that there was minimal plowing and that seeds were often broadcast on flat surfaces and it was reckoned that the yields were about two-thirds of what they could potentially have been in Gerlach. So people are not farming terribly efficiently, according to the Central Board. And Captain Robert Elliott, um, who is the itinerant relief officer for the Central Board, complains that the plan on the Gerlach property doesn't meet his views, as it still goes on the primitive plan of making people jacks of all trades, fisher, fisherman, farmer, minister, weaver, to the perfect fulfilment of the adage that they are the master of none. Um, so people uh, are struggling on the Gerlach land. Famine eventually hits in 1846. It's caused by um, a fungal infection called Phytophthora infestans. And again, from one of the central board reports, we have a description of um, what it looks like, that the areas are completely blackened and that the shores of the potato plant are black and brittle, breaking like burned clay. Um, the Irish crop failure, of course, proceeded in 1845, and it's only in February 1846 um, that people start to notice that the potatoes are giving way um, in Scottish localities. Um, but there are far fewer Scottish deaths. Um, this is perhaps because Scotland's economy is more resilient. Um, it's also because there is much better charitable organisation. And it's also partly because um, people are more alert to the danger because Ireland has already suffered so badly. Um, the government does act quite quickly and repeals the Corn Laws in 1846 um, to import cheap grain um, and to relieve the severe famine in Ireland and to compensate British agriculture for the loss of protection that they had been receiving from the Corn Laws, Peel introduces an act to authorise the advance of public money to promote the improvement of land in Great Britain and Ireland, which people know to be the Drainage Act, um, in which loans are given out at 6.5% interest for fencing and enclosure and drainage, of course. And petitioners for relief in the early years in 1846 are directed to that act, but there are many complaints that that act doesn't go nearly far enough. And so charities are created to fill the void that the government isn't managing to relieve. Um, the Free Church, only three years old at this point, springs into action 
And it was uniquely well placed to do so because its two main congregational centres were in the suffering highlands and in the lowlands where money from wealthier congregations could be raised. The need for charities is because of uh, the state of poor relief in Scotland. Um, now, the, the Poor Law Scotland Act in 1845 was meant to make the provision of relief more centralised um, and a board of supervision was set up to oversee assessment and distribution of poor rates. Um, whether or not this was actually achieved is very debatable. Um, but importantly, although the English Poor Law Reform in 1834 had made provision for the able-bodied poor um, a part of its law, uh, with creation of workhouses and poor houses, there is no such equivalence support for the able-bodied poor um, from the 1845 Act in Scotland. Um, and so the job of relieving the able-bodied poor falls to this organisation called the Central Board. And the Central Board are the driving force behind the construction of destitution roads. So it's worth thinking about them in a bit of detail. The Free Church, Edinburgh and Glasgow charities that had been set up to relieve the Highlands merged in February 1847 and with a fund of £209,376 it's thought that they were the largest charitable organisation in 19th century Scotland, um, which is impressive given that this was such an age for philanthropy. When the board was set up, um, it was split into Edinburgh and Glasgow sections. Initially, responsibility was divided up as follows. The Edinburgh section was to deal with Orkney, Shetland, Caithness, Sutherland, East Rothshire and West Invernessshire. But in the summer of 1847, it became clear that this left too many of the hardest hit areas, particularly the Hebrides, to Glasgow. And so the Wester Ross area was also moved um, under the view of the Edinburgh section. And so it's the Edinburgh section that we're going to be talking about when we're thinking about the construction of destitution roads in Gerloch and more generally in Wester Ross. The Edinburgh section was made up of 43 ordinary members, including 13 lawyers, five ministers and three merchants. This was really Edinburgh's urban upper middle classes. And it was led by William Forbes Skeen, an Edinburgh lawyer with a passion for the study of Celtic history. In 1837, he published his book, The Highlanders of Scotland, Their Origin, History and Antiquities. And he would later go on to be the historiographer royal for Scotland in 1881. Interestingly, uh, Charlie Withers describes the board as a quasi-governmental organization. There's certainly some truth behind this. Um, the board was in frequent contact with government officers, such as Edward Pinecoffin, Charles Trevelyan and John McNeil. Um, and the board did mostly follow the government's line of minimal intervention, laissez-faire and the principle of no relief without work. There were also similar lines of Calvinist doctrines running through both the central board and the government officers. Um, particularly Charles Trevelyan used to write to some of the inspectors for the central board and they would exchange biblical quotes like St Paul um, in Thessalonians saying he who does not eat work also should not eat. The reality of whether the central board was a quasi-governmental organisation or not is slightly more complex. At its creation the board was a sprawling and disorganised mess really. Um, the power for the actual supervision and administration of relief fell to local committees, which held considerable devolved power, and these tended to be made up by local ministers and other members of the community, like school teachers and merchants. Um, interestingly, the Gerloch local committee is criticised um, for not adhering to the board's policy for relief. So you can see there that there's quite a lot of tension between um, local officials and people residing in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, the local committees were disbanded in 1848, following a series of articles in the Scotsman which criticised the board for pauperising assistance in the Highlands. There was the thought that the board was helping the Highlanders to become over-reliant um, 
on charitable assistance. And so they are replaced by a paid inspectorate of relief officers from the army and the Navy. And this idea of the board as an organization that is constantly in change is quite important for the story of the destitution roads as it links up to the way that the board's aims change throughout its years of operation. In 1847, their sole aim is to stop the loss of life. They're not interested in improving the Highlands at all. And this is really shown when a group of Edinburgh ladies are asking to distribute seeds among the Highlanders and they ask to use the central board's um, knowledge of the area and their networks to help them to um, perform that charitable uh, action. And the board refuses because it says that nothing other than the prevention of loss of life um, is, is within their remit. But from 1848 onwards, the board's aims start to change and they become more interested in leaving a permanent legacy of improvement in the Highlands. And the destitution roads are really the central part of the central board's plans for the improvement of the Highlands. Um, here are some quotes. Uh, the first one here is from Hunter in The Making of the Crofton Community. He says, destitution roads were the central relief board's great practical accomplishment and Tom Devine says that they stand to this day as the basis of the modern communication system in this part of the Highlands, a lasting monument to the famine relief programme. So here we get on finally to those three important questions. What were the destitution roads? Where were the destitution roads? And the more difficult question, why were they built? So what were the destitution roads? The easiest answer to that is that they were famine relief works. Um, there were other relief works as well, of course, for example, in Gerlach, Lady Mackenzie's hosiery project that linked up with the central board and their contacts, Mr. Hogg in Aberdeen and the Lowlands. Um, but lots of the work that is done is on these destitution roads during the famine years. Um, land was drained, a base layer was put in, and road metal was put on top. They were between 12 and 18 feet in width, drainage waterways or turf drainage on either side. Um, interestingly, there's a lot of complaint from the central board about how ugly they turn out once they've actually been built um, and what a blight on the landscape uh, they are. There are also more complications in this story. There are actually two different types of destitution road. The first one is test work, and it was mostly done uh, during 1847, that earliest year of the central board's operations under the local committees. Um, it was overseen by the board directly and remunerated directly by the representatives of the board. It was operated on the principle of less eligibility, which I'll come on to more in a minute. Um, and it was also mostly short stretches of local road. The second type of road are the types of road that I would suspect more people in the audience would know about, um, which is the cooperative system. Um, they were constructed from 1848 onwards and they were joint funded by the central board and local landowners. Um, payment was done half and half between the two. Um, wages for the workers were paid by the proprietors. Part of the idea was that it relieved administration duties from the central board themselves. Um, and it would also save them costs the central board only agreed to cooperation when it cost less for them than they predicted normal relief for the famine would do. And these were often more ambitious communications between faraway places. Now, where were the roads? Um, on the left, I have this horrific image. Um, please don't try to read all of that. The text is far too small, but those are, that's the list of all of the roads that I can identify as destitution roads from the central board's records. On the right, I've picked out some of the ones that are um, more related to Gerloch, um, those test roads that I'll let you read through, and the cooperative roads below, which were built um, with Sir Kenneth Mackenzie of Gerloch, although in reality, um, it does appear that it was um, Dr. John Mackenzie who requested surveying from uh, the Royal Engineers. Um, and indeed, it, it is his request for surveys from the Royal Engineers that becomes the basis of the new system. 
So I've tried to map these as well. Um, and there you can see um, those roads in blue are the roads that were constructed before the famine, the major roads that were constructed before the famine. And those roads which are in red are the um, cooperative roads. And those purple triangles are the test roads. Um, I can also bring up um, that table again if you're wanting to look at a particular road and identify which one it is that you're looking at. I'll leave that up there for a second for everyone to have a look at. So the next question after identifying what the destitution roads were and where the destitution roads were and sometimes still are is was road building a rational response to the Highland famine? Certainly historians have criticised the central board and said that it's not a rational response. Um, Jim Hunter has said that the central board's developmental policies made literal impression on the overall Highland situation. And Devine has said that the new network of roads in Westeros failed and that its schemes were probably doomed from the start. There's a criticism that the central board fundamentally didn't understand the underlying social and economic problems which had led to the Highland Famine. As Smith puts it um, so pithily in Louisiana, two and a half decades later, the people wished nothing to be brought to them and had nothing to send away. And so roads were hardly likely to change this. Um, Devine also makes the point that the central board, and this is his quote, seemed not to comprehend that the most efficient, speediest and cheapest form of communication in the area was by sea. Um, I would argue that this is a bit unfair on the central board who firstly acknowledged the limitations of what even their huge fund could achieve. Um, they were constantly noting that even though the fund was large, it could never combat the, the sheer extent of destitution that was being suffered in the Highlands. But secondly, they also displayed uh, comprehension that maritime communication was more important for the Highlands. And when relief did need to be sent urgently, um, they sent schooners full of, of meal to the Highlands and didn't use road networks. Um, so then the troubling question is, why build roads at all? Why were roads um, chosen as a famine relief project? So I've got three theories that have been put forward um, to run past you all. Theory number one comes from Hunter, and it's the idea that the central board was appropriated by landlords and their interests. Um, he gives the example of the road from Laird to Laxford, um, which really did very little other than improve communications to his own deer forests. It didn't connect towns or any assets that were valuable to ordinary local people. It's perhaps a slight oversimplification though. Um, not all landlords um, were uh, trying to appropriate the funds from the central board for themselves. Um, Matheson on Lewis and MacLeod on Skye bankrupted themselves to relieve their tenants. And in 1850 alone, the Gerlach family spent almost 1,500 pounds on their tenants and relief. So there's clearly something more complex going on here just than landlords appropriating the central board's funds. Theory number two is from Devine and that it's a failed economic renaissance. Um, Devine argues that it was an attempt to link the Highlands to more prosperous Southern and Eastern economies. Um, and that it was an attempt to integrate them into a national system of trade, capital and movement of materials. There is certainly some evidence for this. The board talks about linking Highlanders to their more favoured brethren in the South and East. Um, and they also talk a lot about creating more trade links with Glasgow and to the South. Um, but to say that the board had misunderstood the geography and the economics of the highlands and that it was a failed economic renaissance um, 
is unfair for some of the reasons that I gave above, that the board did realise that they weren't going to be able to make any huge changes. And they also understood uh, that maritime communications were more important. Theory number three um, is inspired by uh, a book by Christina Fenio, which draws out that um, there was much lowland contempt for gales, and it was a contempt that was often racialized. Um, think back to uh, sort of pseudo anthropological studies that marked gales as an inferior race, like Pinkerton in, in the 18th century, and, and those views continue on. Um, and are expressed by people like the Scotsman's commissioner, James Bruce, at the time of the famine. Um, and so there's a thought that the destitution roads um, and the, the project of their construction might have been a gruelling task set to challenge Highlanders who had been stereotyped as ignorant and lazy. Again, there's probably some truth in this. Um, and certainly some of those racialized undertones come through in the central board's reports. Uh, but there's also a recognition that the central board has been set up to help Highlanders and that they have a duty to do so. Um, and um, interestingly, those uh, elements of the press, like the Scotsman, um, criticise the board for being too generous. So, so there's clearly something more complex than that going on, even though all three of those theories have an element of truth. In them. So to try to answer this question, I'd quite like to go back um, a century earlier and to think about some of the history of Highland Road building and what other historians have written about other networks of Highland Roads that have been built. And when people think about road building in the Highlands, they tend to think about General Wade's, um, what uh, a scholar called Joe Gold Goldie says, um, was his conquest of Scotland through road building, um, based on this idea that it's easier to pacify Jacobites when they have fewer places to hide and, and um, military can access the highlands more easily and that they therefore become less likely to rise in the first place. Um, and important in this idea is that roads somehow change the quality of highland territory, they make it less advantageous for um, potential Jacobite uprises. And so the question is, were the destitution roads also designed to alter the spatial qualities of the highlands? To think about how this might have been done in a slightly subtler way than uh, the military intervention of General Wade, um, I had a look back at um, some of these scholars who, who are materialist scholars, um, like Patrick Joyce and Patrick Carroll, um, who have argued that societies and infrastructures are co constructed. Joyce, in particular, looks at the postal system um, and its development. Um, during the Victorian period and the way in which it enabled new systems of capital exchange and communication and fundamentally changed Victorian society. And, and so there's this idea that societies make infrastructures and infrastructures make societies. So can we think about the destitution roads as a spatial and material intervention into Highland life? Is it in some way much like the postal system linked to the advance of commercialism, capitalism, and maybe the dismantling of traditional livelihoods. Was this part of the aim of the central board? I'm going to argue that it is. Um, and to start, I think part of the point was to create a territory that was fit for a free market. Free market thinking is in the ascendancy in the mid 19th century, laissez-faire and minimal interventionist policies um, have really taken over from um, the mercantilist political philosophies of earlier times. I think that's particularly clear when you compare the Great Highland Famine in the 1840s and 50s to the way that relief was given um, during earlier famines, like the 1690s, um, during the 1690s, the government got really heavily involved. Bounties were introduced to encourage the trade of grain, and there was significant action against forestallers. And for example, in 1782, there was a £10,000 grant to sheriffs to help the distribution of grain to ordinary people. Um, but these sorts of uh, mercantilists and paternalistic governmental relief 
uh, options are not really available in the 19th century, so committed are they to laissez-faire. Um, and this isn't helped with the, by the fact that free markets are equated with a higher state of civilization, and that's a point that I'm hopefully going to come back to. Um, so it was noted that the territory in the Highlands simply wasn't suitable for a free market in the 1840s in its, in its state as it was. Um, some land was described by the chairman of the Edinburgh section of the board as being like a prison. Um, and Gerloch is described as being, um, as if it were cut off from the sea, um, cut off from the mainland, um, as if it were cut off by the sea. Um, that's a, a quote from the itinerant officer, Captain Elliot. Um, and as a result, there's very little grain trade um, in that part of Wester Ross during the famine. It's noted that there are no dealers of grain in Ley or Ullapool. Um, it is important not to push this too far. Uh, it has been noted that there are um, some significant grain trades going on in Gerlach at this time. So not everywhere is without a grain trade, but significant areas of Wester Ross are. Um, and the boards are particularly blunt about their desires for the roads to help stimulate this free market within Highlands when they say that roads are necessary to bring producer and consumer together. And it's not just an economic renaissance, it's not just attempting to boost the productivity of the Highlands, it's actually a whole change to a political economic system or an attempted change to a political economic system. Um, there's much denunciation of the, the evil truck system and other practices of the moral economy um, and the way in which roads and more free market trade will help to um, lower prices and end those practices. Um, relief officers like Captain Craig in Shetland note that uh, in areas without roads, commodities tend to be about 50% higher. Um, and that in response to that, populations were being forced to pay for their food in kind or through promises of future work, which often never materialized. And so for Gerlach and Wester Ross, this network of roads is described as a great public advantage. Um, one of the ways in which it's such an advantage is the way in which it helped mail travel through the area. Um, it used to be that post had to be carried on someone's back um, on an 18 mile mountainous journey from Pool U, where the mail depot was to Kinloch U. Um, and it's noted that the Loch Marie Road um, would help mail to travel faster um, up to the highlands. But it's not just materials that they're hoping are going to circulate uh, more due to the roads. It's also a sort of cultural circulation. Um, the populations in Wester Ross were described as neglected, and it was thought that the roads would bring a free circulation of intelligence to the area and that they would be forced to interact with more advanced society um, and that they would improve as a result. Um, one itinerant relief officer um, hopes that it will bring uh, them under more notice from public opinion. Um, he particularly notes that he would like to see uh, the public opinion change habits of cleanliness and dress in the Gerlach area. There are reports that there were dung hills outside Croft doors um, and that perhaps if people traveled to the area, um, the local populations would be put off from this practice. Um, but also, perhaps in a slightly more sinister way, it's an attack on um, Gaelic livelihoods. Captain Elliot notes that he hopes that there'll be more English speaking travelers who make it to those areas of neglected populations like Wester Ross, and that it would convince people to abandon the Gaelic in his words. Another key point of the roads was trying to change the spaces of Highland labour. And in particular, it was hoped that it would um, uproot Highlanders from their potato patch. That's a quote from the Central Board's uh, relief records. Um, it was thought that Highlanders were too rooted to their croft and croft work, 
and the central board wanted to see them assume the more legitimate role of day laborers rather than the sort of jack of all trades that we heard them being described as earlier by Captain Elliot. And it's hoped that the roads will encourage internal migration. Um, again, in another fabulous metaphor, the central board say that they hope that it will stir Highlanders from their native peat reek um, and that it will give them the geographical access, as well as the training, which I'm going to come on to in a second, to compete with any day labourer in Scotland. And going on to that idea that they need training, it was also thought that the, the construction of the roads themselves would help to train Highlanders to habits of industry and labour. So here we get on to the conditions of labour on the road, which is why it's called a destitution road. Highlanders were seen in 1847 as unsuitable as labourers and in, uh, in an industrial age. William Skeen, who's the head of the Edinburgh section, describes Highlanders as reposing in the bosom of two graceless sisters, sluggishness and ignorance, which is a great quote and shows some of those uh, racialized elements inspired by Pinkerton and, and perhaps Bruce as well. Um, but it's thought that this is due to um, their love of potato agriculture because run rig and potato agriculture rendered toil and labor almost unnecessary. And the, the, board's, um, the board's records uh, state that famine can be the only consequence of a lack of toil and labor. I can see some people making faces, perhaps those who've tried to do potato agriculture and found it much more difficult themselves. Um, but work on the roads was expected to, to teach Highlanders lessons of how to be labourers like the working classes in urban areas at the time were. They were expected to work for eight hours a day and six days per week. And the tasks that they were given were absolutely backbreaking. They were expected to break half a cubic yard of road metal using various implements like crowbars, hammers, and spades. And another important point here is that they were working during a famine. They were working on almost empty stomachs and they're not being given much meal at all to perform that work. So here we get on to what the destitution test was, which is why the roads are called the destitution roads. The central board needed a system to decide who was eligible for relief because that 1845 Poor Law Act had not given relief to the able-bodied. So from 1847, under those local committees and under the test work, a labour test is set out. Applicants for relief are given one and a half pounds of meal for each day of labour, but that one and a half pounds is a maximum for good work. And if there's the perceived lack of effort, those on the test works were entitled to dock pay from the workers. But following the institution of a paid inspectorate, which as I said earlier, comes after complaints from newspapers like the Scotsman that there's too generous assistance from the central board to Highlanders. That labour test is upgraded, if you will, to a destitution test and one pound of meal becomes the maximum allowance for labour on the roads. And there's also a crackdown on the over generous exceptions that are given out by the committees. So these labour tests and the destitution tests are performing that sort of less eligibility tests that workhouses and poor houses were doing um, for the new Poor Law Act in England. The idea is that they would refuse relief to none who accepted the test, that the conditions of the test were so harsh that only those who were truly destitute would accept relief under such conditions. And it was thought that this would prevent improper claimants. And that's evidenced by Kilmure rent strikes um, and people who just refuse to take part in the central board's activities and um, they report that they would rather sell their stock um, than embarrass themselves and uh, debase themselves by working on these roads. And the board um, 
labels this a very wholesome sy symptom, which is quite a sinister thing to say about a very destitute population choosing to sell their stock instead of receive relief. And there are horrific descriptions of emaciated workers struggling to conduct their work due to malnutrition. Um, even some of the uh, more sympathetic paid relief inspectors from 1848 onwards note that people just aren't being given enough food to conduct this work. Um, and local committees start petitioning in 1847 and afterwards um, to say that people just need more food to be able to carry out this work. It's difficult to tell if the cooperative works um, were operated under similarly tough conditions. Um, but my best guess is that they probably were based on this idea that the central board only accepted cooperative work in place of test work when they believed it to be a cheaper option. Of course, as noted earlier, um, Kenneth Mackenzie, or perhaps really um, during his minority, Dr. John Mackenzie, um, does initiate the system of cooperative work and the entirety of the Gerlach estate is um, relieved by that means from spring of 1848 onwards. Um, and the 1847 costs for Gerlach relief were 1800 pounds, but they go down to 1,263 pounds in 1848 um, because of the cooperative system. So this, this low level of expenditure probably suggests that cooperative system workers were enduring fairly similar conditions. As well as the spaces of labour and linked to it, um, it's hoped that the roads will change the spaces of food provisioning. There's a proposed new relationship with agriculture and food that the central board sets out. Instead of every man um, living on his croft and, and primarily uh, subsisting off, off potatoes, it's hoped that one man will be a farmer, another a labourer at wages, a carpenter, a blacksmith and many fishermen. And fishing and labour for fishing is particularly encouraged by the central board. Um, they are um, a key part of the construction of the, the pier for fishing at Barakro, and it's hoped that the destitution roads will also link up um, southern markets to, um, to Wester Ross, um, and that these enterprises will start to become more profitable. And it's hoped that agriculture will be done for profit rather than subsistence as well. Particularly optimistically, um, in 1850, the board says that it hopes that exports of grain will be coming out of sky within the course of a few years. Um, and it's noted that grain is a superior food. James Scott says that it's visible, divisible, accessible, storable, transportable, and rationable. And going back to that sort of idea that what they're aiming to create is a free market economy and a territory for a free market economy, of course, grain is much more suitable for a free market economy than potatoes are for those reasons that James C. Scott gives. And it's hoped, of course, as well, that the roads will give a more reliable uh, means for those products to be conveyed to the south um, rather than maritime communication, which is often disrupted by storms, it's hoped that the roads will always be accessible and it will help to generate profit. It's also hoped that food will come in from the south and the board notes that purchased food is the hallmark of a civilised society, hence why they haven't considered the Highlands a civilised society up until that point. And so what their main aim is to make that purchased food the principal part of the population's diet. And in order to create that agricultural change, there needs to be a new property regime, a new spatial regime of property in the highlands. And tentatively, I'm going to suggest that roads were also important to, to that project, that they helped aid trends of enclosure and expansion. There was a general wish by the central board to end what they call the pernicious run rig system. The run rig system was one in which strips of land were divided 
on a rotating basis by ridge and ridge. Alternatively, a rig was about 240 paces long and six paces wide, and usually reallocated every second or third year with each rig separated by unplowed butts that took up as much as 10% of the land. And the board thinks that this was a fair and community-based system, but one that was too inefficient. And they note that they think that the roads will help to teach the Highlanders a sounder organization of space, that roads will um, help to uh, delineate different areas for different parts of agriculture and stop cattle, for example, roaming over crops. But it's also hoped that it will open up an abundance of land that is not used, as they describe it, in more fertile valleys. So I'm going to conclude before um, hopefully answering some questions. Um, the three points that I'd like to make about why the destitution roads were built is firstly to create a territory suitable for a free market and one in which um, food is purchased rather than moral economies and potato agriculture and subsistence. The second is to attempt to move Highland populations away from being crofters who are mostly conducting agricultural work with jack of all trades employment on the side and make them in the mold of industrial laborers from the urban areas of the south. And my third point is that it was to help um, enlarge and enclose farming land. Um, and that's linked to the two points above, creating agricultural activity that's geared for profit. Is there any evidence that this works? Well, that's not really what I was looking into, um, but um, I have some potential thoughts. There's obviously the problem of looking at events that happen afterwards and thinking that there's a causative link between the destitution roads and trends afterwards. Um, but there is some interesting evidence from the Napier Commission that there might have been an impact. Charles Roberts, Robertson, the surgeon from Ochterkeon during the time of the Napier Commission says that people used to depend on their crofts, but that the Loch Marie Road opened up the country and that people have not depended so much on their crofts since and that they have betaken themselves to manual labor. So it's possible that the central board's plan in that regard actually worked. Angus McInnes from Sky notes that following the famine and the construction of roads, there was a large increase in the sale of tea and sugar. So perhaps people were purchasing more of their food. And Donald McKinnon from Sky um, notes that uh, roadsides and dikes, which were constructed during the famine, were part of the enclosure of hill pasture land that was lost in the area in the time between the famine and the Napier Commission. So more research needs to be done into what the long lasting effects of the destitution roads were, but it's very possible um, that they were quite large. Thank you very much for listening and I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Jamie. That, that was a really thoughtful and um, critical view of, of the, well, the destitution roads and the work of the central board. Um, and I'm sure it has raised some questions. And An observation, uh, yeah, a very interesting talk uh, and one point that I that I felt didn't maybe come out but worth mentioning is that the roads in question were not something that that uh, were thought about in the 1840s they'd been aspiring to build these roads since 1807 and we have in the museum the minutes of the committee of the sixth district who were valiantly trying to build roads ever since 1807 and getting nowhere and uh, around somewhere in the late 1830s, they had a sort of crisis meeting where they said we must do better, and they sort of uh, rejuvenated the whole program. Uh, and the the roads that were built were very much in line with the ones that they promoted in the late 1830s. Uh, and you know, in some ways, it's a little bit like we had almost a duplication of that situation in the in the 20th century, where we had the Crofter County schemes that were devised in the 
in the 1930s, but weren't built until the 1960s or 70s, you know, and it's almost a parallel. It was just simply lack of funds that prevented them getting anywhere. So that was more an observation than a question. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's a really fascinating point that it it takes the the famine and the the relief yes. fund to be generated before they can go ahead with with these well, schemes. It, I mean, in, in that respect, the the famine was a, a sort of a fortunate accident in a way, although not a very pleasant one. Yes, yeah, and and of course it's it's described as a, a providential blessing many times by yeah. by the central board themselves, which yeah. um, is is another really interesting turn of phrase and and yeah. says a lot about the way that they thought about improvement and and the state of the highlands. Yeah. I, I would add to that really fascinating point as well, as well as needing the money, um, it also needed someone who was uh, particularly well organised and. Um, and was driven to to see it through, and I think um, Dr. John Mackenzie in the Gaelic Estate is yes. that person in, in man, 1848, yeah. um, and that he's so proactive, and that he is the one who comes to the board with the idea for a cooperative system in which the funds yeah. are used in that way, um, and that then that policy which is developed on the Gaelic land is then rolled out in other parts of Scotland. So. Gearlock is very important for the story of the destitution roads. Yeah. I was just going to, to ask what the, what the reasoning would be for teaching people new skills so that with the, with the hope that they would move away or move down to the lowlands. Because I would have thought if um, they were trying to promote you know, better communications and different kinds of activities and so on, that they would have needed the labour to stay in the area. So I'm a bit perplexed by that. Yeah, I think um, there, are, there are maybe a couple of different answers to that question. Perhaps the place to start is um, the, the central board believes that the main problem for famine is one of overpopulation and that there are too many people who could labour, but that there is not enough employment to go around. And of course, 1846 and 1847 is a year of construction mania on lowland railways. Um, and so the central board sees that opportunity and actually sets up a fund um, to suggest that some of the labourers who would be working on the roads otherwise um, go down and work in the lowlands um, instead of staying in the highlands and um, and taking the relief that's offered by the board. So I, I think the, the main answer to your question there is um, that the central board thinks that there's too, too many people who could labour and not enough labour to go around. And so um, increasing people's mobility is a response to that um, problem. Thank you, Sue, for your question. Um, I have a few questions here in the chat. I'll um, rattle off a couple to you, Jamie. So Alison's just pointed out, like Roy, that um, you know the, the the idea of these roads was here long before the famine, and that in the old new statistical accounts, the the ministers of the parish had um, been emphasising the need for them. Um, Carla was asking how many of the goals of the destitution roads and the relief efforts in general were actually materialised. And how long did it take? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's exactly where I think my own research in this is very lacking. Um, as I said at the end, um, that uh, it's, it's difficult to know the answer to that. Um, there are obviously so many other um, uh, events in Highland history that are important during that period. Um, there's John McNeil's report, for example, in, in 1851. And there's, of course, a whole new wave of emigration in the 1850s, perhaps the most um, intensive wave of emigration that there is at all. And so the Highlands change so much in other ways, as well as the destitution roads, that it's difficult to pinpoint what the destitution roads actually did. Um, although I'd 
point you back to what I was saying at the very end there about the Napier Commission, um, that some people do know that the roads have changed what life is like for ordinary people in the Wester Ross um, area and in, in Gerloch specifically as well. Um, so it, it probably did have at least some of the effects that the central board was intending. Richard's asking whether we know who was expected to pay for the future upkeep of the roads. Yes, the, the answer to that is proprietors were expected to do future upkeep for the roads. Um, and um, there's a lot of worry in the central board reports that the roads have been so shoddily built that proprietors will not be able to um, afford the upkeep of the roads. So that's an excellent question. Um, here's an interesting question. What's the landscape in the background of the portrait of General Weird? Oh, um, that's a great question. And I'm afraid I don't know. Um, if I find out the answer, um, I, will, I will send a message back later. <laughs> Funny enough, it's the second time today I've looked at that portrait. Oh, interesting. I didn't even notice the background. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, if anyone knows, do let us know. And actually on that point, Jamie, somebody is asking whether it'd be possible to send copies of the slides that list the destitution roads. Yes, of course, um, I can send that. Perhaps on. if you could send this to Mark, he, he can make them available. Yeah. So we've got a few more questions here. Bear with us. Um, Juliet says, thank you very much for a wonderful informative talk. To what extent was the practical function of the roads second to the roads moral and improving function that was supposed to transform the idle highlanders into productive members of society yeah that's an excellent question thanks juliet um yeah i think that there's um there's certainly this imaginary geography um that is underpinned by um, Pinkerton pseudo-anthropological views of Highlanders and um, sort of quasi racialization um, And um, lots of this is a, a moral scheme and, um, and, and that is certainly one, one aspect of it. I, I would say that the practical function of the roads is probably more important, or at least the central board claims in its reports that it is more important, um, particularly because their opening um, year is so focused only on um, relief and no improvement at all. I think they have quite a lot of time to reflect on the problems of the Highlands, um, and then they identify um, these problems in their investigations in 1847. And I think they really are trying to make a practical difference when they implement them in 1848. Um, and even they note that they are um, ideas which can fully be practically implemented, that it's the best they can do given the funds and the circumstances they have. Um, so yes, it is, it is a mix of sort of utopian improvement discourse and practical changes um, but I would argue that the practical changes are important too. Um, Serena's asking whether any women were working on the road schemes. That's also a really good question. Um, in Gerloch the answer to that is certainly not after 1847. Um, Lady Mackenzie starts her hosiery project um, that is also operated financially in a similar way to the cooperative system and uses the central board's links with um, Mr. Hogg and Aberdeenshire and the Lowlands. Um, but in other areas, um, women do work on the roads. There's a particularly fascinating excerpt from um, a Shetland uh, report by one of their officers, in which they say that women are by far the best and most industrious workers on the roads, and that they get through considerably more work than the men, um, which is fascinating, uh, particularly because women were given only three quarters of the amount of meal that men were for their work on the roads. There's a question about um, 
specifically some uh, resources, archive resources, I'll maybe forward that on to you, the one about Greenwood Estate and Merrick Banks. Um, yes. That, that might not be one that you have just in your head at the minute. But I can definitely reply to that one in writing and give you what, what information I have on those places, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And um, we've, we've also got um, a, a nice rhetorical question here from Graham. Had the Central Board not existed, when would the West Highlands have actually had the roads built? I'm expecting you to answer that one. Just oh, my item, but... that's, that's a great question. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure what the answer to that is. Um, as was noted in that first wonderful question about how, how long the roads had been planned for and how it took these um, two sort of fortuitous uh, moments of there being the funds available in such an odd time and someone in the Gaelic area who was so proactive about seeing the roads built even though they'd been mothballed at an earlier point um, it's really difficult to tell how much longer it would have taken to build these roads if they hadn't been done at that time. Um, I, I couldn't give you an exact date, but possibly quite a long time. Yeah. Right. Just I'm going to go with one more question, but before I do, Rod is informing us all that General Wade is standing in front of the Carrier Pass, which is completed in 1731 on the road from Fort Augustus to Dalwini. So thank you very much for that, Rod. And um, I think a nice final question here, Jamie, because it leads us yeah. on to the future is Emma's question about what were the biggest unanswered questions you had in terms of your research and what follow on research are you hoping to do? Yeah, so um, one answer to that question goes back to the what were the actual results of the destitution roads and can we even know what happened because of them? Another one that I'm particularly interested by is um, how ordinary people um, reacted during the central board's operations. Um, there's certainly a tendency um, to treat um, Highlanders as very passive in historiography and not think about the ways in which they were active agents in their own history. Um, and particularly when there are these descriptions of emaciated laborers. It's so easy to feel pity for um, the Highlanders as objects and not think about them as real people. So one of the things that I'm trying to research at the moment is how Highlanders responded to the central board, um, what their thoughts on the board's relief systems were, um, how they opposed them in some ways and maybe welcomed them in others. Um, and um, to see if that can make a more complete picture of some of these changes that were implemented due to destitution roads. Right, and, and you'll be very welcome to come and have a look and see whether there's anything here in the museum archive Thanks. online that might help with that. Yeah. That's very kind, thank you, yeah. So thank you and good evening to you all. Best grandma, oi kia